one of the topics on the AP Physics C exam, or one of the units, is rotation. And rotation includes a number of different topics, as you can see by the bullet points, and it accounts for 14 to 20 percent of your multiple choice score. So it's a pretty significant part of the test. And in this video, and in others that follow, we're going to be exploring the topic of rotation by completing some free response problems. So here is a problem from the 2019 AP Physics C exam. You might want to pause the video and read the problem over a couple of times, maybe even try to solve part A on your own before listening on. And in part A, we are asked to derive an expression for the angular speed of this platform. We have to express our answers in terms of the values given in the problem. Now, in order to help us understand how to derive this expression for the angular speed of the platform, we're going to take a look at the platform from an overhead perspective. So if you imagine looking down on the platform, then you would be looking down on a circular cross section, essentially. So we're going to redraw the platform from that perspective. And then we will label the radius of that platform. And if you go back to the original diagram, the radius of the platform would be located from this central axis here all the way out to the edge. And we can see from the diagram that that would be represented by the distance capital D. And then we go back to the problem and we note that the wheel, which is that small white disc, exerts a constant horizontal force of magnitude F tangent to the wheel until the platform reaches a particular angular speed. So it's important for us to be able to draw that force tangent to the platform. So in essence, we have a force exerted on the platform and it's exerted tangentially and we're going to label that F. Now for us to calculate the angular speed, we're going to actually have to look at the formula that gives us the final angular speed as a function of time. So this is right off the reference tables given in the test or on the test. And we can see that we're going to be calculating this value right here. And they're labeling that omega p. So we'll do that accordingly. And we go back to the question and we notice that the platform starts at rest. So the initial angular speed is zero. We can knock that out of the problem. In addition, the symbol they're using for time is actually delta t, so we'll make that modification. Now, we can see from this equation that in order for us to come up with the final angular speed, we're going to need to know the angular acceleration, so that's alpha. Our AP reference tables tell us that the angular acceleration is going to equal the net torque divided by the moment of inertia of our platform. And in addition, the net torque would be produced by that single force acting on the platform. So if we look at our reference tables, we would see that torque, and here is the reference tables, torque is at the top left there is equal to R cross F. So we're going to make another substitution in which we do R cross F. Now a cross product would have a particular magnitude. They don't put this on the reference tables for some reason, but when you have R cross F or any cross product, you can rewrite the magnitude of that as R times F times the sine of an angle between those two vectors. Now let's look back at our picture and look at R. R is the distance from the rotational axis to the point of contact where the force is being applied. We can see that that distance is actually symbolized by D in this, pic in this picture. So we'll make some room here, and we're going to replace the R with the capital D. The F, of course, is F, and then the sine of the angle can be addressed next. The angle between these two vectors is 90 degrees. The sine of 90 is 1, so essentially you have DF times 1, which of course is just DF. And then the moment of inertia was given in the problem. It was symbolized by IP. They call it the rotational inertia, but that's the same thing as the moment of inertia. So we're going to fill that in for the value of i. So this is our angular acceleration. We're going to be able to take that and plug that in for alpha in order to come up with our expression for the final angular speed. So this would be the correct answer to part a of the question because we've expressed our answer in terms of i, p, d, f, and delta t. So that's the form that the college board is looking for. Let's examine part b of the question next. And part B asks us to determine an expression for the kinetic energy of the platform 
at the moment it reaches that angular speed of omega p that we were looking at in part a. Now, the platform is rotating, so the form of kinetic energy that it adopts is the rotational kinetic energy, which is expressed by this formula from the reference tables. So all we really need to do is plug in the given values and the expression we developed earlier for the omega. We might wish to put an omega p subscript right there just for the sake of this problem. Now, the rotational inertia, again, was I sub p. And then for the omega p, we're going to plug in that expression that we found earlier, this expression right here. So technically, this is the answer, but we might wish to simplify it by squaring the bracketed term. Let's be careful to understand that what we're squaring is encased in those brackets right there. We can see in the numerator, we would have df and delta t each squared. So we'll have df delta t. All of those are being squared. In the denominator, we have i sub p. That is also being squared. So we'll write it as follows. And then over here, we have another term of i sub p and then we have the one half now that two is in the denominator so we're going to put that two downstairs there and then we can just simplify this a little bit by canceling a factor of the rotational inertia so that factor will cancel with one of these factors leaving us with the following form so this is the correct answer to part b of the question let's take a look next at part c in part c we have to derive an expression for the angular speed of the wheel, which is symbolized by omega sub w. So we're going to need to develop some relationship between the speeds between the platform and the wheel. And it's a potentially a little tricky to see this, but one trick or one sort of method you might wish to envision is imagining that the platform and the motor-driven wheel are each covered in some paint, let's say. Now they are touching each other, and let's just say the platform is covered in some pink paint, and let's say that the motor-driven wheel is covered in some green paint, and they're touching each other, and they're both spinning, and as the platforms spin, it's going to, let's say in one second, spin, and it's going to move by that much distance right there. So that would be sort of the linear distance that we would paint onto the wheel as it spins in one second. But as the platform spins in one second and we paint it pink, the motor-driven wheel in that same one second would also be receiving the exact same amount of paint. So in other words, the distance that we would paint in green across the wheel would be the same distance that we would paint in pink across the platform. So all of this is to say is that their speeds, their linear speeds, are going to be the same. In that one second, they're both traveling a linear distance equal to that to the same value. We're putting down the same amount of linear paint, if you will, in that one second. So we can say that the linear speed of the motor-driven wheel is going to equal the linear speed of the platform. But of course, linear speed, just in general, is equal to a radius of the spinning object multiplied by its angular speed. So what we're going to do is replace the linear speeds with their angular counterparts. So for the wheel, we would take the radius of the wheel, which is lowercase r, multiply that by the angular speed of the wheel. And then for the platform, the same idea. Now remember, the platform's radius was capital D, and the angular speed of the platform was this omega sub p. And now all we need to do is solve this for omega w. So we would just divide both sides of this equation by lowercase r. And then we would have our final answer. This is the expression for the angular speed of the motor-driven wheel. Let's next look at part d. So this is interesting. You might want to pause the video and reread this a couple times to yourself because we're dropping um, basically a second platform onto the initial platform. And that second platform or that disc as they're calling it has the same rotational i sub p as the platform so this has a rotational inertia of i sub p and so does this disc that's being dropped onto it and it's basically a collision but it's sort of a rotational collision these objects are spinning as the collision takes place both before and after the collision so what we can do because it's a collision is we can conserve momentum it's a set of spinning objects, so we have to conserve angular momentum. So we might say that the final angular momentum is going to equal the initial angular momentum. 
Now, as for the initial angular momentum, the only object that was spinning was the platform. And so what we'll do is fill in the angular momentum of that platform. You might remember that angular momentum is the rotational inertia multiplied by the angular speed, which we had found to be symbolized as omega sub p. Now, on the other side, we're going to talk about the final angular momentum. And because these two objects are going to sort of couple together, they're going to combine to form a single rotational inertia. Ask yourself, well, what would that rotational inertia be once the two objects couple together? You can imagine how the disk is sitting directly on top of the platform. I know that's a fantastic picture, but they're both spinning together as a single object. What's the rotational inertia? Well, it would be the sum of IP and IP. So we would actually have two IP for the final rotational inertia, and then we're going to solve for the final angular speed of these coupled objects. Now, if we look carefully, we can divide both sides by the two IP. And then we have a factor of i sub p in both the numerator and the denominator. So the final angular speed of these coupled objects is this omega sub p divided by 2. That is the correct answer to this part of the question. That was part D. Let's take a look at part E. Now here's another instance in which you might want to pause the video and reread what's going on here a couple of times first before listening on. But basically we have an unknown object that is being dropped with its center of mass directly above the center of the platform. So it's somewhat similar to the previous part of the problem. Maybe we can come over here. We've got the platform spinning around and then there is some unknown object that's basically being dropped onto it. And it's going to then cause them to couple together and then the question notes that once they're kind of coupled together, they're now rotating together at an angular speed, omega final. So this would be omega final. And then as it spins initially, this would be the omega initial. And then we have this graph of several different trials of repeat, uh, of different, excuse me, different values of the initial angular speed. Now, Part one of part E is a relatively simple thing. All it asks us to do is to draw a best fit line for the data. So let's go ahead and do that now. So a line that looks something like that, you kind of want to draw the line through the center of the points, if you will. Some of the points might be above the line, some of them might be below the line, but anything like that would be acceptable to get full credit. Now part two says, using that straight line, calculate the rotational inertia of the unknown object I sub U about a vertical axis passing through its center of mass. Well, to do this, we're gonna to have to once again conserve our angular momentum during this collision. So let's take this picture below here and we'll set the final angular momentum equal to the initial angular momentum, just like we did before. Now we can look at the initial angular momentum first. The only object that's rotating is the platform. So we would take the rotational inertia of the platform and multiply it by its initial angular speed. Now on the final side over here, they're both rotating as a system. They've coupled it together. So we're gonna have to add together the rotational inertia unknown of that little object to the rotational inertia of the platform, I sub P. And then that's gonna be multiplied by the final angular speed. So now what? Well, we want to solve this equation for a particular variable here. And we recall that the question wants us to find the rotational inertia of the unknown object. So we have to solve this for I sub U. And to solve it for I sub U, we can divide both sides of this equation by omega final first. That way it cancels on the left side. And then we would subtract the rotational inertia of the platform to cancel it out on the left hand side. So now the question becomes, what do we actually plug in here in order to solve for the rotational inertia of the unknown object? Now the question did give us the value of I sub P. If we go back up here, we can see that I sub P was equal to 3.1. So we're gonna be able to plug that in. Now using our best fit line, we can select a set of points or a set of values for omega initial and omega final. And we do that by just locating a point on this line. So for example, we could look for a nice clean lattice point. This point right here seems to be on the best fit line. And these increments are measured as, well, let's see, right here would be an initial angular speed of three radians per second. 
And then if we follow this point over to here, these increments go by 0.2s. So this would be a final angular speed of 1.2 radians per second. So in other words, you're going to be able to plug in an initial angular speed of 3 radians per second and a final angular speed of 1.2 radians per second. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back down to this equation and plug in those values along with I sub P. Now, once we put that into our calculators, we're going to get a rotational inertia of the unknown object of approximately 4.7, and that would come out in kilogram times meters squared. So that would be the correct answer to part E of the question. Let's take a look at part F. So here they're asking us about the kinetic energy. They said that the kinetic energy of the spinning platform before the object is dropped on it is K sub I, and then the kinetic energy of the platform object system is K sub F. And we have to compare those two kinetic energies. And you might wanna stop here and just think about what kind of collision was taking place. Recall that when the object was dropped onto the platform, they stuck together. So what kind of collision would you have when the two objects are stuck together? And of course, what you have is what's called an inelastic collision. And we know that because the objects stuck together. Now, the next thing to ask yourself is, well, what happens when objects stick together? What happens to the kinetic energy? And in that situation, there is a loss of kinetic energy, always. When objects collide and stick together, there is a loss in kinetic energy. So we could say that there is a loss in kinetic energy. And what this means is that the kinetic energy final after the collision is going to be smaller than the kinetic energy initial before the collision. So the correct answer to this question would be right here. And you can answer that simply based on that conceptual understanding that with colliding objects that stick together, there's always a loss of kinetic energy. Now in part G, it says that one of the students observes that the center of mass of the object is not actually aligned with the axis of the platform. So if you recall, when the object was dropped onto the platform, it was supposed to have been dropped at the center of mass uh, excuse me, at the axis of the platform. So it was supposed to be dropped basically right in the middle of the platform, but instead it was actually inadvertently dropped over here. So it's not dropped at the axis of the platform. It's dropped a little bit away from it. And we have to ask ourselves, well, how would that affect the rotational inertia of the unknown object? Well, you might recall something known as the parallel axis theorem. And the parallel axis theorem tells us that the rotational inertia is equal to the rotational inertia about the center of mass plus this extra term known as mh squared. Now the center of mass was again supposed to be right here in the center of the platform, but this object was dropped away from that center of mass. It was dropped a distance of h away from the center of mass. So if you look at this equation, you can see that because of this extra term here, because there's that extra distance h, that's going to cause the rotational inertia to be larger than what it should have been. And so we can say that the rotational inertia of the unknown object is going to be greater than the actual value of the rotational inertia of the unknown ab object, and that is due to the parallel axis theorem. So I hope you found this video helpful. I'm hoping to produce additional videos based on the AP Physics C topic of rotation, so stay tuned. In the meantime, thanks for listening.